this um, World Forum, is there anything uh, unique about this meeting in terms of its social implications that stands out to you? I don't know about the social implications, Ramdas. I think what is unique about it is uh, it's much the largest meeting I've attended with an enormous diversity of really very high quality human beings in different fields. And that's interesting in itself. One wouldn't expect them to agree altogether, and they certainly haven't. Yeah. There are many things I don't agree with. And yet it's not so much the communication of positions or even uh, the search for consensus so much as to allow in what actually is out there and feel the resonance for oneself of what is needed and called by the present situation. What do you think is emerging as what is needed most uh, profoundly in terms of I mean, I'm, I've been struck by the, the wrestling with something like uh, consumerism as a, as a current issue in the relation of environment to consumerism. Does that stand out to you as a... As a I think this is a, certainly a top-level preoccupation at the meetings. It's not mine. Uh, I would say this is part of our problem-solving fixation that we've always been involved with. We're almost addicted to problem-solving, aren't we? Yeah. And we do it from one part of ourselves, as if that could solve all the problems. And this is where science and technology as its manifestation has uh, gone so far off the track because it's coming from only one part of a human being from this stupid mind that chatters away hmm. and fixes things and has wonderful ideas. But the real need, if you ask me, was much more to explore the inner frontier of experience that science has not been used to facing yet. I think it will. But which needs to be researched by experience not by data banks and computers, but by personal experience. There seems to be a reticence by, of people in power to look within or to value reflection rather than reaction. And yet I don't find that totally absent. I think in the two co-chairs, uh, both Mikhail Gorbachev and Rud Lubbers, were very perceptive in defining uh, not just the outer problems, but a sensitivity to the inner ones as well, and the interactions between the two. I don't know whether you had the same impression. Well, I see that it can be presented as an intellectual understanding, but I, I'm trying to translate it at the next level. Do, do you think that the question of whether these people value that enough to enter into a, an action that involves their own in looking inward that way. Well, here they are calling for a new paradigm as the basis for a new planetary civilization. And uh, God bless them, I hope it works. <laughs> but where are you going to find that except in human experience that is personal, mm. begins with a personal moment of awareness of a sufficient quality, intensity, that it's not just an ordinary associative reaction as we have all the time. We don't really need that to solve our problems. And I'm not sure they're seeing that. I agree with you there. Do you see any training programs that are training leaders, that are, tra that are, are politically uh, oriented in training? or business-oriented that are have that kind of concern about the inner quality of development? Well, I suppose uh, there are a few. I don't pretend to be in touch with everything that's going on, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't find on my radar much evidence of it yet. I think there's too much uh, dichotomy between those who have tried to explore their inner frontier and those who are active in the world. Uh, 
Uh, I've just published a book which is trying to bring together the uh, spiritual and ecological, if you like, as elements uh, that might wake us up one day if it gets bad enough to do so, or if we perceive how bad it actually is. Do you think that trauma really works to awaken deeper exploration on any kind of sustained basis sufficient to be transformative? I don't think transformation is normally a sustainable state. Right. I think it happens in flashes. Yeah. And then there are traces of that experience that remain. But uh, I don't feel that we're looking for turning on enlightenment like we turn on a light bulb, that it stays on. It's a moment of seeing what is and then back to abnormal. Yeah, but you said that if things got bad enough, yes, that there might be a turning inward. My evidence, my suggestion, and you've had many more experiences dealing with large-scale traumas in terms of your social role in society, is that trauma tends to lead people, maybe for a moment, to be social. The, bow, the uh, barriers break down. But um, generally, it leads fear. It leads to increased fear. It leads to increased contraction. It leads to increased paranoia and violence. I mean, I don't see it going the other way. Only if we reach a stage at which uh, at least some individuals are so painfully aware that we've come to the end of our present civilization, that our values are bankrupt. It's not just that we bankrupted the Earth's resources, but we ourselves. Uh, and that's why we're behaving in this way that is bankrupting the Earth. But I don't think it would take very many people to turn it around. I don't imagine that there were that many millions in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, maybe thousands, but not millions, who were of a mindset and an awareness of what was needed to actually change an entire society in a much shorter time than any of us had ever thought possible. Hmm. And uh, even here in America, uh, we've got off smoking remarkably quickly, to some extent. Yeah. So mm -hmm. these transformations, uh, even though they're not at the top level permanent, say, or widespread, can have very pervasive effects in social terms. You mentioned moral um, breakdown, or yes. and, the, and you can feel the breakdown of social structures very quickly that would have supported the moral uh, continuity, like fa extended family, for example, yes. the role of elders, things like that. What, you can't turn back the clock. Mm -hmm. You can't go back to social structures that you had just because they once were good. How do you see an evolution of social forms that would allow values of continuity, sustainability, justice to get renewed or refurbished? Or what do you see as the most uh, hopeful? Well, that's one? interesting because I don't really see it as primarily a reinventing of institutions. Even Gorbachev here was saying that he'd made a mistake in trying from the top down to introduce perestroika. Mm -hmm. I think it really has to bubble up from the people this time. And that's why, since I retired from government, I've been much more trying to come from the non-governmental organization side, from, from the people, uh, in tackling whatever I see I might be able to help with. and. I think it's going to come much more from the bottom up than the top down in the next century. Really? Interesting. Don't you? Well, I'm looking at what... Not interviewing in, you, perhaps. Well, that's but. okay. <laughs> I, but what... It, I mean, I'm asking... I'm wondering what are the bottom up signs or social structures that would allow that to happen? I mean, I see... Would it be just a yeah. malaise, a dis... Because I look at inner cities and I see... I see the polarization, say, between rich and poor as a very, um, 
uh, intense catalyst mm -hmm. of destabilization. And I don't see the disempowered people speaking up other than through revolution, for example, or other than through violent means at this point. I don't see that kind of... I, I think they feel so disempowered but like isn't, the Native that, Americans, uh, for isn't that exactly the reason why the only way around such a violent outcome due to polarization is the transformation of the inner drives that are polarizing? And this can only come, as we were saying earlier, in the moment, in a, a way of seeing that is a little free of my ego reactions and concerns and associations and really takes place in the body where I can be rooted in a reality that in my mind is quite away from me. Do you think that that kind of inner consciousness and uh, perception can happen in somebody who is worried about their food and their survival? I have seen, as you have, in a country like India, where the faces of the poor are much less agonized than they are in Harlem, or one of our ghettos. Or the faces of the rich in the West or, as well. Or, for that matter, the faces of the rich going in to see their psychiatrists in Park Avenue. Exactly right. Both. Exactly right. So the polarization is equally tense at both ends. Yeah. And how to let go of that in a way that will allow us to behave towards each other and to create society that is based more on cooperation and love, mm -hmm. that that can come through in a way that it's very difficult for it to come through right now. Everything is competitive instead of cooperative. It's all third chakra instead of fourth chakra. Yes. It's all, all right. it's all power. Power over instead of shared compassion. And as between yeah. cultures, uh, yeah. instead of learning about, let's learn from each other. Mm. I think part of the weakness here has been the relative absence of other cultures. And um, we might have, another time, tried to place more emphasis on Asia, where I feel there is much more to be uh, dynamic growth, not only in the economic sense, but in the cultural and religious sense as well. Does it make you sad when you, because you've been so connected with the East, does it make you sad when you see the, uh, the exporting of the Western values into those cultures in such a uh, indiscriminate fashion? Well, the human mix uh, in the longer term may take care of itself, I hope so. I think those cultures are much more resistant than we might think, and it doesn't spoil a good uh, uh, Buddhist in Japan or Cambodia uh, to drink Coca-Cola, perhaps. It may spoil his teeth. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. But culturally, he's not so poisoned by wearing jeans instead of traditional dress. And these superficial cultural homogenizations are less important. Yeah. The real ones are persistent and alive and well. And I think that's where I would put my hope in for the future. Um, my, I've worked with the Social Venture Network now yes. for about five years and um, uh, trying to um, explore with them the concept of work as Dharma. Yes. And that's a very interesting thing about the motivation or intentionality of work. And uh, that's one of the things that I feel can get lost easily because what is exported is not just Coca-Cola but is the value system in which uh, material success is the criteria of, um, of a healthy society. A to the total, the total bottom line, not just a little part of the bottom line. So that what I hear when I hear the Indian ambassador is beginning to rationalize something happening in India that um, 
isn't all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when they talk, you talk about the past more sentimentally than as if it's living truth, because the values get shifted. I, I feel them happening even in the villages that I live in in India. Now, maybe you don't, and maybe you say that they're all immune to this, but I don't know. I mean, I think we're talking about value shifts, not just jeans and Coca-Cola. Yes, I think we are, and I don't know how that will play out. A lot of the people we're talking to, including the Indian ambassador, are very westernized themselves. Yes, yes. And... Uh, that becomes a problem if we generalize from them to a whole culture. So I don't think we should do that. What is uh, going to be interesting is the cross-fertilization of cultures ahead, I think. As we begin to uh, try and make uh, perhaps what one could call a science of the sacred, to see what works, to face our increasing awareness of crisis with an inner strength based on what actually works wherever it comes from, and not by making a, a big omelet of everything put together haphazard, but by keeping it pure in its integrity in each particular line, wherever it comes from, but giving it respect and using that as the basis of a pluralistic future culture that will have room for all this diversity. Great. I, I heartily agree with the protection of the lineages. Yes. Because when you wash it all into one, one thing, it, you lose the power of it. Of course. What I'm seeing, and I also hear the, um, the need for being selective in which practices are appropriate at a historical moment and in a, in a culture at a certain point. For example, the, the renunciate path of withdrawal is a hard one for the West. Karma Yoga, which has bhakti in it and it has uh, service and it has uh, meditation and it has wisdom component, that seems to me, that's, why, uh, that's what I market, I would say as a more appropriate yoga to take the Western mind from where it is, because that's what's working for me. Can you... Uh, well, I don't try and market the Gajeev work exactly, but I try and practice some of it, some of the time, and I find very much the same resonance with you in taking something into life, which if it isn't attempted, even if you fall flat on your face a million times each day. Yeah. Nevertheless, if you're not attempting that, you're not working in an inner sense in any true way in our tradition, just as in yours. Yeah. How does the uh, Gurdjieff system work in terms of, what are the, well, let's see how to say this. In your social action roles, what are the most powerful things you're getting from your practices that are altering the way you behave in those situations? Increasing awareness of reality in its totality, inner and outer. That is a sort of ideal statement. I don't say that we succeed in practicing that. I myself certainly do not, but I think that is the direction we're pointing in, that only in that way can we harmonize the, the two forces. This means that you're cultivating an awareness at this moment that includes me yes. and as well as you, so that since I'm doing the same thing, it's talking to itself. Yes. Okay. And I think that's the nature of our conversation, which I find back and forth very harmonious. Yes, of course. Of course. Because of that inner action that is invisible and probably for most people who watch it quite incomprehensible. I don't know.
but intuitively felt. Intuitively felt is much more important. Much more important. Yes. Much more important. Yes. I mean, I think that's what Thich Nhat Hanh represents. Yes, I do too. Those people intuitively feel something, even though their intellect can't, yes. can't handle any of the words or the yes. five precepts or any of those kinds of yes. things. Yes. And so that's what I mean. This works. Yeah, sure. For you and of for course, me. Of course. Different modes, but we see something actually working some of the time. Of course. And I think this is the hope that we can transform human behavior one at a time, in time, before we wreck the planet. Can we? You think there's not time to do that? It's pretty iffy from where I'm sitting. I think it's iffy too, but it's just that iffiness that is adding an intensity to the search. Yeah. Without that, no waking up. Yeah. That's what I meant earlier. Yeah, yeah. But the inertia is, of course, very powerful. Enormous. And so then the question is, what is the power of the human spirit or mind or whatever that is in undercutting or changing the direction of that inertia? It's interesting. I mean, I just imagine John Seed, a, an ecologist from Australia, a lovely man. He is indeed a friend he, of mine, too. He's a dear being. And um, hmm. um, he said he was describing cattle rushing towards or swine rushing towards a cliff, all going full blast towards the cliff. He said, that's roughly the situation you have. And the question is, what would move the direction of that or change it? And how, what would be the collective consciousness shift? We're talking, you know. All right. Let's use another image that John Seed has also given that what matters is the tree and not the leaves. We're all behaving as if we were leaves that had no dependence on a trunk or roots right. yes. or sun yes. or anything outside. Yes. We're just alone with our leaf. And in fact, the interconnections of life are much more exciting and much more powerful than anything we can imagine from the leaf point of view. And it's that that I feel is the uh, hopeful outcome that we need if uh, there is a sufficient change to have a planetary civilization in the next hundred years or next millennium. I watched from the 60s on, which is sort of when I became conscious enough to see anything happening roughly other yeah. than my own neuroses, I, I watched the obsession with individualism. With yes personal desire, personal want, mm -hmm. and personal space, and the, the violence that did to the balance that is required between membership in systems and community and the individual. And I feel that we got ourselves out on a leaf, <laughs> yes. and it's very hard to get back into systems again, even though we exist as because, of, because we are part of systems. So quickly, though, the idea of systems can become a mental abstraction and not a felt experience. Right. And it's that that we need to connect with if we yes. have to make it real. Yeah. It was actually, for me, it was the helping of my father through the last ten years of his life yes. that reconnected me to the, a sense of my membership as a part of a family. Yes because up until then I was too busy with my own spiritual journey yes. saying they don't understand me I can't spend time with them I must spend time with satsang or sangha yes you know yes. have you had changes in terms of your valuing balances as a result of, the, of uh, your inner work I guess when I say it I think the big change for me was uh, or one of them um, I took a group of scientists to have a look at the Kuwait oil fires and the rest of the g environmental damage oh, yeah. after the Gulf War for Friends of the Earth. It was an international team and we were right up close in all the mess of oil lakes and fires burning, nearly 700 of them. And it's a pretty overwhelming external impression and I suddenly 
began to see intuitively without any rational process at all, as if in a dream, that my complicity in using oil the way I use oil to jet back and forth to San Francisco, for example, is part of the problem. We are the problem and that I am not separate from that problem, and how I behave is not separate from that problem. And even if what I can do is minute compared to the scale of the global warming, climate change, nevertheless, the conscience that was awakened in that experience is exactly what I need to live with mm -hmm. if there is to be a world. I I understand, and I feel that very, very powerfully. And I, there are so many moments that that comes back to me. Yeah. The way of that interdependence or interbeing, as yes. Thich Nhat Hanh calls, yes. calls it. Yeah. When you went for Friends of the Earth, you're now doing mostly non-profit or NGO Entirely. type stuff. Yes. How old are you now? I'm 77. Okay. Now, therefore, you're an ideal person for me to talk to about the issue of what is the change in role and the change in curriculum for an individual as they enter into the aging stage of life. I mean, I'm coming out of India with the ashramas and the sannyas and the, the, the stages of life where at 60, I mean, people lived a different length of time then when that was set up, but still, there's a stage of life where your business turns, in a way, away from the world, or turns in relation to the world in a different way. And you, I'm sure, have reflected a lot because you have Eastern and Western blood in you, mm -hmm. in your in your veins now. Tell, talk to me about that issue. It's not something I have thought a great deal about because I haven't yet got to. Uh, looking at myself as that geriatric, <laughs> but certainly uh, the role that one can play as one gets older is much more a sort of grandfather role, and I think it can be a more relaxed uh, involvement, but I don't think the involvement should be cut. So I don't entirely agree with the ideal of sannyas and going off into one's ivory tower and sitting on one's cushion. I don't think that's the way I want to end. And in fact, whenever, although I may retreat for a while and get recharged as I need to do, I think I then need to use that in life. I remember uh, giving a a birthday party in Delhi for an American lady who is quite well known in the Gandhian movement, Wealthy Fisher. It was her 90th birthday. And I said to her, uh, what is the secret of your energy? She said, there's only one secret. Spend it. <laughs> ah, that's, not, that's great. <laughs> that's of great. course, this doesn't mean that we don't have quite a lot of work to do on not wasting it. Yeah. But the intentional spending of it, I think, is very productive of more energy. And therefore, even for the elderly, I think we shouldn't begin to have an idea of ourselves that uh, makes us uh, hypochondriacs for the rest of our days and withdraw from active involvement. Well, then, looking at the kind of active involvement, though, is yes. How does that shift with age? What, what, look at it a little, because the nature of which things you're doing, I mean, the relation to power in the society changes, the role, the grandfatherly role, or the elder role you were talking about. I'm trying to get a feeling for the path you're following, which is the path of involvement, but there is a different quality of involvement that is happening without you labeling yourself as a, you know, a, an old croak or a, ger a gerontological problem. <laughs> well, I've, uh, for instance, just begun to write in the last few years. Is that about it? 
And um, ideally, I would like to think, I don't know whether this will prove true, that with age one becomes a little less self-centered because there's not that much time left to be ambitious in. And besides, you've done that. You've done it. So what the, you know, yeah. leave it. Yeah. yeah. Let That's it right. go. And this feeling that we can let it go, and in the meantime, what needs to be passed on is the experience of direction, both inner and outer, that the next generation can find useful in facing the mess that we have left them. Uh, Mr. McNamara has been apologizing for Vietnam recently. Right. And I suppose our generation can uh, make similar, much more global apologies. Mm. But what can we transmit if not the beginning of a sense of experience? These inner movements of opening to a higher reality are so elusive that it may take the entire lifetime to come to the threshold. Thomas Merton told me that that was his experience. It was just shortly before he died. He was in India visiting the Tibetans. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. if we are beginning to get a little closer to the threshold, not only of dying, but of inner expansion, living, then that transmission can be precious from that experience. And not because we want to make a name for ourselves or, or uh, make a career for ourselves. That's all finished. So that is the quality of the, one of the qualities of the uniqueness of that stage of life. I think so. Of that uh, amalgam of inner and outer and something to pass on about a perspective. Yes. The question, when I compare, like if I interview somebody like Oren Lyon, uh, yes. the, uh, who's a beautiful, beautiful. man, He's coming out of a traditional society mm -hmm. in which the elders pass to the children a direct oral transmission of a set of value precepts, basically, mm -hmm. and stories and myths. Mm -hmm. I don't feel I grew up in a traditional society. I feel I grew up in a techno-scientific, blup, whatever it is, such that obsolescence is kind of built into the game so that I, that young people don't find me relevant. You're no obsolete how, by the time you're 60. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you hear the issue. And we're living in a cultural system where you may have great things to pass on, but nobody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, there's always someone listening if you have something real to pass on. Because reality is very persuasive. What is less interesting and less persuasive is people passing on their so-called uh, inventions that represent nothing but their fixed ideas and yep. fundamentalisms of one kind or another. Mm. And of course, that's very boring, and we don't need that. Do you, would you like to be uh, teaching now? Would you like to be uh, formally create, creating a salon or some kind of an environment where you could transmit the quality of being, not just, uh, because writing is a certain quality of transmission, and I felt that come through in your book very, uh, I mean, I felt, I felt brotherhood with you from reading that book. I felt that mm -hmm. Thank you. that you and I knew something together, yes. and that was a very joyful thing. That book was yes. joyful for me to read. And now I'm wondering, what are the vehicles that you have available to you, or how is that transmission to occur? Well, without pushing for it, if it happens, I'm there, and I'm available, uh, just as I have been for this interview. Uh, but I'm not trying to seek it or go after it or have a marketing program for it. Uh, it's just to see what happens, what is needed, and uh, where I can serve. Is, is that roughly the way you become involved in things, because you're just available and people reach out? 
or do you have a program say i really want to work on this area or i mean you've absorbed a tremendous amount of teachings from when i read your book in terms of your grief and studies along with your other studies of zog chen etc etc and i'm saying now does that get you to a point where say now i must transmit this and i must find a suitable vehicle for the transmission of this Quite precious right. jewel i have i have to pay back my debt yeah to my teachers and i can never do that fully i feel the inadequacy of whatever can be attempted but how to do that with some integrity uh it's so easy to uh, begin to take oneself so seriously that you think uh, you have the answer for the world i think the world has to tell you what it wants and when it wants it and whether you're needed or not <laughs> you sure of that that's interesting because maybe the world like with a child uh, do you assume the world will come knocking at the door of that wisdom <laughs> I mean you went and knocked at the door of that wisdom and you worked with hundreds of people throughout your career who didn't go knocking at that door for that wisdom. Yes. That probability is pretty slim. All right? And what should I do? I wonder about how to make yourself a visible instrument for sharing something that see the p- people that come out and become visible often their impurity in the way they became visible yes. corrupts the transmission yes. but you don't have anything to corrupt i mean you've got nothing you you know what are you going to take to your grave you know what's it about <laughs> there's nothing more to do you're not going to achieve anything you don't yes. you know it's not a few bucks yes. so the interesting question is without those kinds of motivations yes. can you just uh project outward into the culture a a a vehicle that allows people because you have the balance of qualities in terms of your worldly skills and knowledge and your inner light that i feel um for you to wait for somebody to come knocking is uh it's not doesn't feel like the full use of that resource I mean so, that's presumptuous of me to say that. Do but I hire help? a PR agent and begin pushing myself around or what do I do? It's delicate. Isn't it delicate? But it, we, we can't let the ego in us that's that is afraid of our impurities or the impurity of the system right be the thing that holds us back from doing that. I hear it's you. too precious a thing to do. I hear you, you and know? I thank you. Yes. I mean I face a lot of the, you know, stuff like that all the time. Yes. And uh and I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I think this not knowing is just the place to begin. Yeah. I agree. And if we are sufficiently delicate in our approach to the not knowing, I feel we'll be told like coming to this conference i didn't particularly i at first said no yeah yeah and uh, then i was called to come and i said okay mm. and then to talk to you and have you tell me that i have something more to do <laughs> very good i hear you yeah and i will try and listen to that and see i look and i say ready. i say well back in the 60s through psychedelics mm-hmm. i got open to something and then um aldous huxley gave me the tibetan book of the dead mm-hmm. and that tuned me into the fact that whatever had happened to me had changed my attitude towards death and dying and that led me to hang out with dying people right. and i did that i've done that for 20 30 years and as a result of that i've gotten into the hospice movement into all of the stuff of creating more ashramic spaces for people to die in more spaces where people can awaken through dying mm-hmm. and awaken through helping dying people mm-hmm. and then um more recently i've looked and said well we brought birth out of the closet we brought death out of the closet how about aging in a youth oriented mm-hmm. techno sublop society how about aging 
why should this be a no-no to speak about, to understand, to see as a spiritual curriculum? So now I'm sort of, and when I go into those fields, it's really, there's some place of quietness inside of me that listens and says, well, there's a place where Dharma can enter. I mean, you're doing it too. I mean, when I'm in Social Venture Network and you're in all the NGOs you're connected with, we're always bringing the message to the same thing. And maybe I'm presumptuous to say, you're not full blast out at this moment, you know, because <laughs> no. I don't know your life, you know. No, I probably am not full blast out at this moment. And uh, I think really that I could do more. But uh, how to go with that intuition and actualize it, uh, it's not just in my hands. For example, workshops? Yes. Have you done a lot of teaching in workshops? Uh, of this usually, interface? Usually in-house Gurdjieff workshops, Yeah. not public ones. I'm teaching at the Open Center for a couple of times in October. Uh, Is that satisfying for and you? I like that, yes. Yeah. And I'm doing a few other talks around, but not perhaps as much as I should. Because I'd love to teach a week-long workshop with you, for example. Well, let's do it. I think that would you? <laughs> I would certainly do it. Okay. I'd be honored. I would love to do that. Sure. I'd be honored to. Good. Because just the chance to... Are you telling me something? Are you telling me something? It's time to stop. <laughs> the time is up. But we've come to the point. We've come to just the point. I will be, believe me, I will be in contact. Uh, would you consider a week, uh, maybe next summer? Sure. At, uh, uh, like at the Lama Foundation in New Mexico, up in the mountains of New Mexico? Would that interest you? I think it'd be lovely. Okay. It's about 150. Depending on dates that we have yeah, to Yeah, well, work we'll work out on there. dates. I'd love to do that with you. Yes, I would too, Ramdas. Thank, Thank you, you, my dear. <laughs> That's great.